The Brandon Peters Show may contain explicit language and detailed plot points. For more information on the show, stay tuned to the end of the episode. And here he is again. It's his show. It's Brandon. Welcome back to another week on the Brandon Peters Show, and one where I'm thrilled to welcome back the Screamcast Stephanie Crawford to discuss 1999's Drop Dead Gorgeous. Stephanie, happy to have you back. And happy to be back. Oh, yes. Sure. We will do it all like this. This is actually... (laughs) I actually attempted to have you back earlier, but that didn't work out. Let's Interesting. Stuff. Are you there, putting me on the spot here? No, no, it's not your fault at all. Because <laughs> um, I was, I was, I, you were originally in the group for the uh, '90s soundtrack songs one, but that did not work out. But here you are yeah. now. Yeah, I have a little lapse between my scandals, so this is a really good time to record. It's a really good one. Yes, and uh, yeah. yeah. Once they catch you, this will be worth so much as recording. I'll hold off till then. Uh, but it, it's funny because last time, I believe you, last time you came on, you had just ended the Screamcast. It was like recently over, maybe. Yeah. And then now it's, fresh, painful. Re, now it's recently returned. Yeah. So how did that come about? You guys just were like, you know what, let's do this. Um, so we kept the group chat, which is um, Sean Rager, the creator, mm-hmm. uh, Brad Henderson, most people know from Vinegar Syndrome, and Mike Delaney, who's the newest addition. And we kept our group chat going and just random stuff. And one day Brad said, let's bring Screamcast back. And we're all like, okay. And it came back. That's all that there was, was to it. That was it. There some people said, why didn't you tell me you guys were planning on coming back? I'm like, we all said, okay. And then a couple of days later, we recorded. <laughs> That's all there was to it. No stakes, guys. Let's just do this. Yeah. <laughs> How many episodes have you put out since returning? We just did our third with Travis Stevens and uh, Barbara Crampton. Awesome. And we're actually recording tomorrow night. Oh. We're bringing back a what's on your doorstep. Okay. So for Blu-ray people, that's usually when they like. Awesome. Awesome. That's good to hear. I'm good to have you back in the, the regular potting world. <laughs> yeah. I'm just so lazy and the schedule. I don't know how you do this every week. Kudos to you. Yeah. Yeah. You have a family. What? Come on, guys. Sleep once in a while. I don't, I don't know how I do it either. Um, <laughs> sometimes I don't want to do it. Sometimes I don't. <laughs> So. Well, I appreciate you putting up with this. Ask my 4K Blues Day crowd. They're probably like, where is he? I'm like, well, if, you, if my video's got a little more views, I'd be more up for doing them a little more regular. You hear that, guys? He's only a hostage. Also, also, um, I've been on, like, review copies haven't been, like, <laughs> flooding lately. Uh, well, actually, lately I have, but... Um, Sometimes I'm like, well, I don't have anything right now. And then I try to make up things. Like I did a hammer horror thing. Like how do you collect the Dracula stuff? Nobody cared. Like my videos like up to that week have been doing really well. And then that nobody cared. I was like, well, F you. I love hammer. So that's how it is. I do too. And I'm angry at the YouTube algorithm. I'm going to watch that tomorrow. Yeah. I promise. I'm going to leave a comment. I'm going to give you a like. Yeah. I'm already subscribed. There you go. Yes. I'll do everything else. I do. I, you know, I did forget a couple things that I do own in there, but. Don't oh, that's me. why. How yeah. dare you? Yeah. Amateur. 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 Speaking of Blu-ray on your doorstep and stuff. So last last episode, you weren't on this. Um, the wonderful Raina Cervantes was. But we talked about we talked about Warner Archive. And I, I talked about how everybody flipped when the WB shop closed. They're like, oh, no, we're Warner Archive. And I had explained, like, WB shop, Warner Archive, not the same thing. Right. That's just a, a storefront for Warner Brothers that Amazon and MovieZing, and there's probably another one, are certified 
Warner Archive replicators because Warner Archive, while not being BDRs, are a kind of print-on-demand service where they're like, okay, we're going to print this many, this many, and with the DVDs, it's a DVDR. So they kind of just move that storefront to Amazon, which probably saves money, but you know, less people needed. And uh, with uh, like literally the day or two after I recorded that, Twitter, the the source of all news, uh, had a guy named Jerry Beck who started tweeting out. He's a apparently former Warner employee talking about how everybody's been fired and saying Warner Archive, Warner Home Video are going to have releases through 2021, but in 2022 everything's going to go and everything's in H- HBO Max land, which those tweets have been deleted since. So I don't know why a guy who doesn't work there, anymore, maybe he has a non-disclosure agreement. I know when I worked in the testing industry, I wasn't allowed to tell who I did stuff for, though everybody did. Like, like I wasn't supposed to be like, oh yeah, I do Lionsgate, I do Disney, all that stuff. But, you know, people do. So I wonder why they would, silence him but there are you know people losing their jobs and stuff and like definitely dwindling down home video but do you think it's going away away do you know a little more because no i don't know okay I w- anything more i w- so like last year like disney like it was like oh they're they're done forever no more 4ks for them fox stuff isn't getting it but we're now we're getting like of course speed aliens but those are you know those are sellers and they were probably being worked on before they got acquired from Fox that's possible but i i just can't see them just Warner Brothers as a whole just saying nope cut off i don't want to put out dc movies on blu-ray i don't want to put out these other things and with Warner Archive like there's a lot lo- that's like their eh, restoration and put a blu-ray out thing so i don't see that as being like a super expensive endeavor right and it's not like they have to pay for acquisitions which right. i imagine would be a big thing yeah it's it's so sad now to be honest i only went to their website when the four for 44 sale was going on right but i checked it out and now it just says where you can stream it where you can buy it on amazon and it's uh it's depressing <laughs> but yeah well I, my thing um, is like they 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 got in this endeavor with Universal to put out Blu-rays and stuff for like the next 10 mm-hmm. years, was it? Like why, or is it them, Paramount, something like that? There was like this push to do that. I'd be surprised if they didn't really fully know what next step was going to be with that because Warner Brothers, they've always been really good with home video. Yeah. Um, they, they're definitely more interested in DVD than they were Blu-ray, mm-hmm. but they do have a legacy with caring about it. And they, I mean, they just released quick change, all of them forever. And they did right. the bad and the beautiful. So, but and at the same time, today's title drop dead gorgeous was one of their, I know they should have gotten me for the commentary, but, but that's <laughs> fine. But you can't deny that um, people buying physical media, those are dwindling and, Streaming is the thing right now, and Mm -hmm. we don't even know how ultimately sustainable that will be, but it's been a pretty great deal for studios so far. So, yeah, I think they've earned a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, Right. but uh, if everything fully wrapped up in a few years, I wouldn't be shocked. I'd be incredibly sad. Right. They've only put out two of the Thin Man movies. They've got, I mean, when when they get done with the Thin Man movies, maybe then they close up. Why would you tease out just a couple (laughs) <laughs> and then, and they still have the second Cleopatra Jones to put out. Uh, but I, I think so. They've been really open more in the last couple of years to sublicensing out to like Shout Factory, Arrow, and Criterion. And I just, if they were to stop Warner Archive and stop Home Video, like the ripple effects for that, I don't think benefit because we're already seeing with Shout Factory and Criterion that. Oh, we're putting out more prestigious titles, and they used to be really good at putting out like the cult movies, the lower level ones, and like that is not like Arrow, especially, has seemingly decreased in the amount of cult movies, which they put out good versions of in favor of like more A titles, like they've been putting out 16 Candles, yeah, like all that. So, I, I would think if that happened, they're like, oh, we'll still sub license, and then. Here's everything, you guys. It changes like us 
looking for more obscure titles to get all this love. I feel like those would. I'm sure you'd have your Severn films, your your Vinegar Syndromes and stuff, still excelling in that, and probably getting a little bit bigger pool. But then they get a bigger pool. They can't put out like 20 titles a month. So then, like, it would take. Say they get one title, it could take years to get through to it based on the roster, and there's like less. But I don't know. I, I just I don't like it. I know streaming. No, I didn't even thing, think of that but, perspective. But there's like, yeah, there's a ripple. Like, I mean, it, remember it took like Synapse Films, one of the smallest ones, and very good people. They do some of the best work. Suspiria took them like four years after they. Yeah, they're it. small company. Yeah, and four. that was a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. I mean, on one hand, if they did close up Warner Archive, but they're like, you know what? We're going to be super cool about letting other people do our titles. Right. We're going to make it affordable. We're going to be open about it. That would make me happy. I don't know. I think Arrow has, as most successful companies are, they've been slowly getting more mainstream anyway. Right. Yeah. Maybe they could even do a sub label or something. And maybe that uh, little boutique labels are still opening up right now and they're doing pretty well if you look at cauldron films and things like that Mm -hmm. so maybe maybe like hey arrow's kind of dropping it with like the interesting weird stuff maybe we can start with jalo yeah then you grow up to the big leagues (laughs) to do john hughes movies i guess but yeah no like it's interesting because i've been dying for a new version of uh dario gento's inferno and i feel like i'm in a hell where it's too big for some of them and not big enough anymore, not enough. I don't know. They keep, the arrow looked like they were building to something and then stopped. And now we're backtracking to Bird with a Crystal Plumage on 4K, which all for it. All, all for, for it? it? All for it. Yes. All, all for 4K it? it. All for um, it. <laughs> uh, I hate it when someone doesn't get it first and then I have to really underline how terrible my joke was. <laughs> well, I, I can't hold that against them because people are crazy for 4K. Like right. they get really angry when these big titles aren't on 4K. I think that's just making customers happy because 4K people are very diehard and they right. and that's a beautiful film. But yeah, uh, the, the excitement of Discovery they had a, like a, even just a couple years ago. Sure, mm-hmm. it's dwindling a little, but they're still doing great work. And there's so many other labels right. uh, that are just getting their fingernails dirty, just digging uh, yeah, so hopefully, you know, it still keeps being a collector medium. Those titles get available somehow besides HBO Max, uh, which I do. I love HBO Max. It's one of my favorite streaming services, but I would like still the ability to buy Blu-rays, even though Best Buy doesn't think it's cool anymore and uh, all the others. But when people Every new photo of the Best Buy movie section is like a dagger to my heart. Right. I, I mean, at least they're still on their website, but I mean, that's what people have been doing. They've been buying them online, so they're like, let's get them out of the store. I mean, even when I was working at Circuit City in the early 2000s, they didn't like the movie section either. They were, didn't, they were just supposed to be like add-ons for things, and they just really didn't care about them like I did. I was the guy who thought it meant the world. I was like, this is, this is it. Took care of it, and they you know, took advantage of that with me, so. Oh, you know. yeah. The one here, it, it, they seem to be on random wire racks like throughout the store. <laughs> so they did not care about the movies that the one here. Hey, you got Saw in 4K. Well, I'm buying my dryer. I'll get that and <laughs> go home watch Saw in 4K. Dry some clothes. All right. Cool. Oh, now I miss fries. Oh, fries. Yeah. That was a. <laughs> the same thing. Just <laughs> random movies right next to. <laughs> dryers and musical equipment. Fries is actually cool. You go in there and be like, "Oh, they carry Arrow titles. They carry yeah. Uh, and they had a cafe. Criterion. Yeah. They had, yeah. I had, like the one here was shaped like a giant slot machine. So you got a cool <laughs> one. So like the one in Burbank was awesome. It had like. A, have you ever been to that one? It no, got, but I've seen photos. It's got the UFO crashing into it. And it looks like a like fifties uh, sci fi movie. The one in my I'm in Indianapolis where the Indianapolis Five Hundred is. So it's like boring on the outside and there's like old race cars in aisles like oh it wasn't car shaped no 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 there was classic cars throughout the building that that was exciting inside there is just photos of old vegas things like celebrities and stuff inside gotcha can you gamble in the fries there or no 
Shockingly, no. You mm-hmm. can gamble at gas stations here, grocery stores here, but not fries. That's probably why they closed. Ah, yeah. Do they have like uh, like what I used to go? It's closed now, but like the Imperial Palace where they had the dealer tainers. They should have like that, but cashiers. <laughs> like Rod Stewart is uh your cashier. Yeah. <laughs> done that. <laughs> Every year, in the small town of Mount Rose, Minnesota, a special competition takes place. I know what some of your big city no bra wearing hairy legged women libbers might say. They might say that a pageant is old fashioned and demeaning to the girls. No, I think you boys are going to find something a little bit different here in Mount Rose. <coughs> Ouch! <laughs> But for two ambitious girls... I believe this pageant teaches you what's really important in life. I dream of getting out of Mount Rolls. I mean, guys get out of Mount Rolls all the time for hockey scholarships or prison. And two jealous mothers... My daughter is the most talented contestant that Mount Rolls has ever had. It's not just about beauty. Go Muskies! Woo! I'd laid on 10 to 1 that it all comes down to Amber Atkins and Becky Lehman. It's about poise. If you could be any tree in the woods, what kind of tree would you be? (laughs) Green. (laughs) It's about tradition. You get your ass up there and show me some tea. It's about winning and whatever it takes. Are we all cops, Howard? Are we all cops? Shut up, Hank. This here's business. (laughs) Dude, don't cough. Oh, my God! My tech costume's gone! Bring it on! From New Line Cinema. What kind of a moron paints stiff ladders right before a pageant? Kirstie Alley, Ellen Barkin, Kirsten Dunst, Denise Richards. Look at that winner. I think she's had a boob job. Oh, come on. She's too young for a oh, boob job. They do that at birth now. What are you talking about? Our pageant is not a peep show. Oh, God, you rule us! Drop Dead Gorgeous. Suck it in! Or so help me, I shove my foot so far! Come on, shake your body, baby, do that conga! Drop Dead Gorgeous, which is directed by Michael Patrick Jan, written by Lona Williams, who is also judge number three in the film, and stars Kirstie Alley, Kirsten Dunst, Ellen Barkin, Denise Richards, Brittany Murphy, Amy Adams, Allison Janney, Sam McMurray, Mindy Sterling, Matt Malloy, Will Sasso, Nora Dunn, Thomas Lennon, and the... Adam West. And it's about a small town beauty pageant that turns deadly as it becomes clear that someone will go to any lengths to win. Stephanie, why did you bring Drop Dead Gorgeous to the show? Oh, well, I have loved this movie for a very long time. So let, let's go back to the late 90s. Going back. <laughs> I'm a huge Kirsten Dunst fan. And that was mainly born from this year. So she did right. The Virgin Suicide. Oh, right. She right. did Drop Dead Gorgeous. And then she did Dick, that oh. great Andrew Fleming, mm-hmm. uh, Nixon satire in a row. And I just fell in love with her. And I created a fan site called Kirsten Dunst Online for her. <laughs> and it was actually pretty popular back in the day. And I was just very dedicated to it. And um, my first job was working at a movie theater when Spider Man opened the oh, weekend, wow. my first weekend of doing it. So I'm like, I'm doing her proud. <laughs> Exactly. I missed this in the theaters. I don't remember it coming out in theaters. I feel like it had a really small opening. If even showed up in Albuquerque at the time, I don't know. But I grabbed it as an X rental blockbuster VHS. Okay. And I just fell in love with it. I'd watch it weekly. I'd memorize it. I transcribe quotes of it for my website. I had the script oh, wow. on my website. Yeah, I, I love this movie. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. I, I, this was a blind spot for me. I sold this. This one was at like when I like Circuit City it came out on DVD or something. We had like a big set because they were those snap cases so you could fit a bunch of them in a row. And I didn't see it till the Blu ray came out. Like it was a blind, like I know, yeah, oddly enough, oddly enough. And I enjoyed it. Like I don't know if I would have back in 99 if I just saw it or young Brandon would have. Who knows? But I, for some reason, I just. Eh, at the trailer and I never saw it and then you know I get mad at young Brandon a lot 
for things. But um, but that's good for this episode because we have two very different perspectives. Right. Yeah. I had to see it and I was mainly impressed. Like I hate to go, oh, it was ahead of its time, but it was because like people don't remember, but like 1999, a movie like this, the fake documentary, especially one that wasn't done by Christopher Guest was not like regular, was not nor. And then this became what a lot of television comedy, what like most television comedies would be this throughout the mid two thousands to still this day. I mean, you, you know, you made famous by the office, but the office is something spinning off of, something like this and all the way to like modern family i mean what we do in the shadows basically pulls this fake documentary stuff it's evolved yes but right here and seeing these this like the cast they have that grows it just i can see how it's become a true cult classic like really i mean it's not a lot of people pull this cult classic thing and i'm like that movie either made a lot of money got great reviews or won Oscars. What are you saying? Like, oh, this is underrated. <laughs> Understand? Like, no, this would be a cult <laughs> classic. This would definitely be underseen. It fits all that criteria. And it's kind of a, a stealth slasher movie in a, a bit with things. And I kind of I kind of dig that. As a I do slasher. like how the original poster art, which is on the Warner Archive, it mm-hmm. very much, if you didn't know anything about that, you'd probably be like, oh, it's like a horror pair. Right. Thing. Right. Yeah. It's not. No, and strong. But you're stuff. right. A yeah. little tweaking, it could be. Yeah, and we're we're in a morgue a lot in oh, this yeah, movie. There, there's, yeah, there is a morgue. <laughs> there is a morgue, and it's strong, real strong satire. Which always, like I was talking about last week on Beyond the Valley of Dolls, over the, when it comes out, goes over the audience's heads. I read some reviews from back then. Didn't seem to understand that or too mean. I'm like, yeah, you're watching a dark comedy. Like, gonna not care. Like that's kind of what happens but i mean like you get to like alice and janney before she's like busting out like way before actually before she becomes like hey let's put her in everything but the comedy and stuff comes from uh, the, the director was like one of the directors of one of my favorite comedy shows of the 90s the state the state yep and did little britain <laughs> fly the concords reno 911 children's hospital community lots of comedy tv but happy uh, endings Sorry, happy that's endings, one of yes. my favorites. Oh, love happy <laughs> endings. Uh, but yeah, like all all that stuff. Like he's pioneered. That's why you get Thomas Lennon as the voice behind the camera with such ease. And then he pairs with uh, Lana Williams, who is a Drew Carey show writer. Um, and she wrote uh, Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse, like her other credits, which part. I didn't. I I didn't love uh, quite nah. as much as Drop Dead Gorgeous. <laughs> Some else I didn't. Like. She did a punch up on the script for Shark Tale. <laughs> I've watched that a few times with my friends' kids. Yeah, it yeah no it, it it's a movie with mobster sharks. I worked it. on that DVD. I'm, oh, <laughs> I've had my nope. share. Uh, but there yeah. goes my deep dive. Right, right. But yeah, it, Kirsten Dunst, who you talk about, I feels like I feel someone like super talented, and the press people like totally failed her because she was just being. A teenage girl through it because there was a lot of like the way the paparazzi followed her around made her seem like some trashy drunk blah blah, blah you know like part that she's being a teen girl and people didn't she didn't really get that actually i have to no. jump in she didn't really get that very much at really? all yeah she she lucked out she kind of fan site but I, 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 I that i can comment on that well i remember like reading things that just seemed like negative about her like uh not going back to spider-man like for one of them and then there was like some oh, her, just... her, her and jake gyllenhaal fornicating in like a bathroom or something like just seemed like just this like, is how warped i am uh okay. that's just how they talk about young actresses so i'm yeah. like oh besides the usual garbage they throw i'm no she got off easy I no guess. i was thinking like uh, you know how they went after Brittany Murphy later on like that that's kind of the level I'm at but no you're right yeah she had to deal with the regular trash no and, and she's so interesting in this movie because I rewatched it last night mm-hmm. I've seen it so many times but it's, it's been a, like two years and there there are scenes where she's incredibly awkward Mm-hmm. But she was already, she was a child actress. You know, she was an interview with the vampire right, yeah. before yeah. us already. Um, and I think that's, they kind of just maybe didn't go, I wish there's a commentary on this because 
So Christopher Guess, he pretty much makes the scenarios and they have to hit certain beats and end up at a certain place, but they can improv within that. Right. So I'm kind of wondering how much they improv in this. Right. It doesn't feel overly so, but I feel like there are moments where they're like, okay, that was exactly the script. That felt natural. Let's let that go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, she's really good. I mean, like the one of my favorite moments is when she is in the morgue and she uncovers the guy that was sweet to her in the lunch line dead. And like, just, she just handles it really well. Like it's, it's really natural. And I did like that a lot. And yeah, she, I mean, she gets to roller coaster it. She gets to be funny. She gets to be sad, dramatic, you know, have drive. It's it just really, really well done. And in a movie that people didn't get to see her do that in, like, because people didn't go watch this movie back in 99. But she did get picked to be Mary Jane in Spider-Man, which is quite huge of a landing when they did that. It also, you know, we also have Denise Richards, who yeah. this is a big year for her, but like, <laughs> She, yeah, Drop Dead Gorgeous, which no one saw, and then, and then James Bond. <laughs> James Bond. This, yeah, and then Christmas Jones, which people can't Doctor. get over the fact that she's not in much of that movie, and it's actually really one of Brosnan's second best one. But she's actually like, I like this like comedic Denise Richards. She is, she's probably someone who needs the right director or something like that. I'm not saying that as a fault on her, just that happens with some people. But she gets this material. Like, she eats it up. She's quite good. Thank you. Like, I, I was going to come in and really defend Denise Richards. I don't know why she has gotten so attacked over the years. I think maybe because she looks a certain way. Yeah. And she played certain roles, but she always knew exactly what she was doing. Starship Trooper, she yeah. played that perfectly right. she's hilarious she's i think maybe the highlight in this movie and i'm saying that as a kirsten dunst fan it's allison janney ellen barkin and denise richards are the mvps of this movie in my opinion she always uh she always knew the assignment yeah. <laughs> and she's she's so naturally funny so yeah and yeah wild things yeah. that's a weird kind of movie that's a weird tone to to get and mm -hmm. it it but it doesn't seem that way mm -hmm. but it is like because there's a dark humor to that it's a uh, sexy in such a, a bonkers kind of way right. but you also have to sell like the thriller aspect yeah and she's incredible in it no like Stop picking on Denise Richards. Right. A well, Tammy and the T Rex. Do you, do people think rules. she's an idiot and she's just like, oh, I guess I'm gonna fall in love with the T Rex? She knew what was going on. She's great. <laughs> right, and I, I think part of the thing is like sometimes some people are better in smaller things or more grounded stuff, and they don't translate to blockbusters well. So 1999 was Kirsten's year. Everybody, Virgin Suicides. This she is. Uh, also in a Holocaust TV movie and a Savage Garden music video. Now, that's a year. That is a year. What Savage Garden music video is she in? I think it's I Knew I Loved You Before I Met You. It's okay. like she's just on a train looking okay. cute. This movie, yeah. Like Denise Richards, her song number in the <laughs> is Yeah. Do we, do we need to say what the plot of the movie is? I mean, we just talk about it. I assume people... <laughs> okay. Yeah, that no, it's brilliant. Yeah, well, the talent show sequence to me is is one of the, the best of the movie. At the top, I, I did say the synopsis before. <laughs> Small town beauty pageant pageant turns deadly. It's a faux documentary. <laughs> the beauty pageant does happen in the movie, so there we go. Yeah, the the dance sequence with a, a puppet Jesus on the cross. To, um, what I need you, baby. Yes. <laughs> It's so absurd, but they set it up perfectly. She's in the Lutheran mm -hmm. Sisterhood Gun Club. She's just one of those people who's like, I'd solve a world hunger with one of my mom's rhubarb pies. I don't know why I made her Southern. They're from Minnesota. My I can mom would be <laughs> peace with one of her prayers. <laughs> Coffee and bars. There, that's that's how I get the Minnesota. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, no, she's so brilliant in this. Just pretending she's friends with the anorexic beauty pageant contestant in the hospital. She's anorexic. She's anorexic. Oh, yeah, she needs to. She's not. She's anorexic. She's skinny, not deaf. <laughs> oh. No, she's. Uh, God, no. I. In, this movie makes me wish she did more dark comedies. Mm -hmm. Boy, she got she is hilarious and this and devious too. 
you believe she could be the daughter of a murder of a murderous Kirstie Alley and also they help her out. With that. Her, they want you to think it's her throughout because you know at first, at first I could see someone on first time watching thinking accidents might be happening, but if you watch it, they really. Uh, like I watched it twice for this, and they really want you to think Denise Richards is causing all this stuff. Like they, well, yeah, you, sh- right. you show the boy that both her and uh, Amber Kirsten mm-hmm. Dunst likes bullet through his forehead, and the next scene she's polishing her gun. Polishing I mean, her yeah, gun, and then when the girl, <laughs> the contestant gets the thing hit down, and she's just like, hmm, walks off from the girl. The stage. Just the little, the little moments in that move the body. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, I, I love uh, John Doe. Is one of the funnier things. The <laughs> complete pedophile pharmacy guy that's one of the judges, and finding him in the background smoking and seeds, and uh, he has the camera, and you, oh gosh, he's just brilliantly not overdone, but done just perfectly. Uh, they don't abuse him too much, but speaking of, this has to be one of the smokingest movies. There's a lot, like this had to be jump. one of the very last ones. Yeah, they're smoking <laughs> indoors. They're smoking like <laughs> ever. And oh, also, I would put as a candidate, maybe not in the MVP, but like right under tier is Sam McMurray. Like he is like like you've never seen. Like he just lets loose in this movie. Like someone's like letting me off a leash finally in a movie. And we first see him, he's smoking and having like a scotch or something. And Yeah, he's always trying to get everyone a drink. <laughs> he had, like when he's at the furniture store, like bragging about how he rips people off and just, he's pretty funny. I I, I like No, him. he's great. And I do feel like uh, really well cast as Denise Richards' parents, Kirstie Alley yeah. and him, they all, all have great chemistry. Yeah. 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 Kirstie Alley, yeah, like she wound up becoming this person in real life i don't know uh <laughs> you might say coming in second place in the prison beauty pageant, the prison beauty pageant. <laughs> oh yeah and the ending uh where they have her released from jail gets revenge on people and sniping apparently that's the second ending they shot because she was originally supposed to commit suicide in prison and the uh anorexic girl was supposed to be the one shooting and that didn't test well with people so they reshot it and had Kirstie Alley be the shooter. Yeah, you don't need to do things like that right much. at the end of the movie. <laughs> I mean, even as is, it's a bit much, but it adds to the newscaster thing, I guess, to be the full story. Yeah. Diane Sawyer thing. Yeah, true. Yeah, it kind of has a To Die For-esque ending, but... Um, yeah, as many times as, as I've seen this movie, when I think about it, I think of it ending at the all the girls tearing apart the cosmetics place that yes. went bankrupt. Like, f- for some reason, that's where the movie ends. And that just stuff is nice. But mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's ending upon it. Like, cause, I mean, you think the movie's going to end with just the local pageant, but then we go on to the state pageant and then we go on to the national. So it feels like it's, you know. Board of the Rings endings. So many endings. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there, there, there's a, and you don't get Adam West back. They tease him at the beginning and he never, he never comes back. Though we do get that hilarious thing where, and she told me Adam West was so horny. Adam <laughs> West was not available for comments. Yes. <laughs> oh, was I was funny. like, he okayed that? Good for him. Good for, <laughs> That's a oh, sense he of has humor. humor. Oh yeah, he totally does. <laughs> he totally does. They also like going back like the Diane story. Diane story was like I don't know if kids now care about Diane story, but this was like a thing in the nineties to have the Diane Sawyer interviewer be like Diane Sawyer because I remember like Scream Two, Cotton Weary. He's all about that Diane Sawyer, Sydney. Got her yeah. Diane Sawyer, and that's like she, that was a name of names when it came to like news or interviews and stuff. No, the last time I heard of her was uh that Britney Spears interview she did and people were like, she was terrible to her <laughs> looking back at it. Oh, a feature film debut of Amy Adams. Yes. And then the next year she did another cult classic. That's one of my faves psycho beach party. Like what a yeah. cool way to start your career. The not so smart cheerleader and drop dead gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And then you're in psycho beach party and then you get nominated for six Oscars. Hey, right. that's a career, man. That, that is. <laughs> that's that ideal. Is. You get to experience everything. That's right. And also, uh, Amanda Detmer 
is her film debut. She'd done some television here. Um, this is pre getting hit by a bus in Final Destination and pre giving yeah. me an angry stare at the line in the arc light back in like 2006. But, oh, that's that's a specific reference. I wouldn't have gotten that one. I, don't I know wonder what I did. I don't know what I did. I was just behind I think her you line did. and she turned and was like, I was with nobody, so I was not talking. You probably look like an ex boyfriend or something. I don't know, but I got a gl- I got a glare from hell, and I was like, <laughs> "Okay, whatever." I-, I used to think you were cute in movies, but now you're. I don't like oh. whatever it is. Yeah, I, I wonder if there's a deleted scene with her because she's dressed as Dorothy from yeah. Oz, and I- I'm wondering if they explain that because well, they're all from Minnesota. St- and she goes up on stage like she's got some sort of blind act routine. <laughs> Yeah, I think and there's some stuff puking. taken out. Yeah, the, the mass. Well, you puke. got to see her puke. Did that make you feel better that she had to deal with fake puke? I'll put on Final Destination. Watch her get hit by a bus. That's all. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> Nobody glared at Brandon. Still a great death. <laughs> Still a great death. Oh it yeah. Me by surprise. That yeah. timing. Mwah. Just boom. It's like oh so shit. Good. Oh sh- every time. But no, uh, I don't know what it. She was probably just having a day. Who knows. Who knows? That's what I say about people when they hear like, oh, a story about a celebrity being a dick. I'm like, they have bad days too. <laughs> unless it's to you. Unless it's to me. Unless it's like, <laughs> fair, yes, fair. I just wanted to get my ticket to run Fat Boy Run. That's all I wanted. I don't know if it was that movie, but <laughs> I, I did see that movie at the Arclight once, so that was kind of funny. Go David Schwimmer, I guess. Um, yeah, there's, oh gosh, there's so much to talk about this movie. Because, I mean, it's one that definitely pays off on multiple viewings. It's clever. It's got layers. That's easy. There's stuff I want to know that I haven't caught yet. Anyway, I've only seen the movie like three times now. But That's the, impressive uh, the, since Blu-ray. Yeah, I'm in the fan club. I'm in the fan <laughs> club. I saw the original title was Dairy Queens. Yeah, I remember that. And the, the mothers were originally, they went for Sigourney Weaver and Goldie Hawn, which is really easy to imagine. Oh, yeah. No, that's one of those things you're like, God, can you imagine? Like, no, actually, good. Good. Which I, I think Ellen Barkin gives us a turn we don't see from her often. So I really enjoy that. I love her in this. She's just the incredible beautician in a trailer park. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> like, d- amazing. When she's like hopped up on whatever at the, at the, the contest. And oh my gosh, she's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I was laughing her ass off. Well, and who knew she was such a great prop actress? So, oh, yeah. uh, she, she's one of the ones she, she survives, thankfully, but there's an attempt on her mm-hmm. life of exploding their trailer. So she gets her beer fused to her hand. Right. <laughs> until they can replace it with a hook. But just the way she wields them is incredible. Yeah. And when she finally figures out how to very messily open up a beer with her hook, just just her her smile of accomplishment after that oh, it's, it's just like it's moments like that that make this movie very true very true <laughs> you know one thing i think about like why has this movie preserved or gained its status or been re- reanalyzed by people and i think it's like i mentioned ahead of its time but it's also very different from like the teen films coming out in this era which i wouldn't i don't know if i throw it fully in the teen but it's got a lot of teen attraction in terms of kirsten dunce denise richards uh, the beauty pageant uh mother daughter relationship things and it's not safe it's not trying to be sexy or popular and i think the documentary approach is rather easy and kind of regular for modern audiences now if you popped it in you're comfortable with that format Whereas back then it might have been off-putting, though Best in Show, I know, I remember that one being something that really took off and a lot of people love that. And then shortly after that, you see like The Office and all those other shows. Yeah, that I think that um, as great as the faux documentary is here or mockumentary, mm-hmm. when it was done, like with Christopher Guest, it, it's usually geared towards adults, or at least it was back then. Because yeah. that's who was watching documentaries. But now documentaries are much more accessible. They're much more popular. So you can, younger audiences can hook onto that immediately. But back then it was kind of a harder sell because this is sophisticated enough to yeah. appeal to everyone. But there's def like you said, I didn't know anything about this movie. I knew Kirsten was in it and some other actresses I liked, like Brittany Murphy and Denise Richards. Mm-hmm. That's all I knew. I knew it was a comedy with them and I ended up loving it. 
but I can imagine this would be a tough one back then to do. I think uh, they didn't sell they, it on that. Like the tra- I don't no. know. Like I wouldn't, I didn't know that. Like if I, if I'd have known it was trying for some kind of interesting format, I probably would have given this movie more of a look than I did when it came out. Yeah, they weren't selling it to the right people. The, it, the Jawbreaker came out this year too. Another dark comedy, pretty different, but you know, still dark comedy with uh, teenage girls. Don't think of how old they were at the time. Denise Richards, I think, is like eleven years older than Kirsten she's, Dunn. She's twenty nine in when this. Yeah, <laughs> that's. I mean, she doesn't look like any teenager I've ever seen it, but she does look Hollywood teenager or not. Yeah, she I pulls mean, that off. <laughs> Allison Hannigan was playing teenagers for in her thirties, so I mean, she, I mean, she it just depends what if you can pull it off. And I, I think for this, Denise Richards pulls it off fine. Yeah, no, it's perfect. And she's such a heightened character. Like she's basically when people mock soap opera villainesses, mm-hmm. that's kind of what she's doing here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we we haven't talked about Brittany Murphy, who you mentioned. And, yeah, like, yeah. She's this is a couple years after Clueless. And just I mean, she's adorable in here. She's got the she's got probably one of the more fun roles to play. Um, mm-hmm. The one that laughs at everything goofs <laughs> off. Which is interesting because she did Girl Interrupted this year too. So <laughs> she needed to have some fun. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And you just, I, I don't know. She has the charm and charisma to be one of the leads in this, but she's down in one of the more supporting roles, which is just no surprise to watch her just climb up to leading movies in the early 2000s. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, she, she, yeah, this is one of nature's perfect cast it's it's just everyone brings it but yeah she she had such an unusual sparkle Mm -hmm. to her whenever she was on she even uh she's normally just like laughing hysterically and talking about her gay brother that her parents prefer far (laughs) over her but towards the end when she's helping out amber to stay in the competition and like Mm -hmm. She really plays that like a real friend trying to help someone out. And you're like, oh, yes, well, it shows, please, it, please it, keep getting good material. It's a nice it's a nice turn to show that this character caricature is also human. It, it, in that time, yeah. and gives you more to the documentary sense that that helps it play. yeah you think she's one note but you know she says like we all know i'm not gonna win so you're like right. oh she's a teenage girl with a defensive thing up and they let her show that you know yeah. that's really I mean, and i saw this as a teenage girl and just stuff like that actually meant a lot to me yeah you know because you're used to being treated like a joke or just an idiot most of the time you're like but there's a billion things going on in my head right now and you know, this is this is a funny way to show that, I think. And the best they could say back then was dot, 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 lots of fun, dot, dot, dot. You can put a lot of negative stuff in those dots, all right? I wish it was <sighs> lots of fun. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. It should be lots of fun for idiots. Like, if, yeah. I mean, even though, like, the little smaller one, like, I love the Soylent Green Girl. Like yeah, yeah, the super actress. Oh, that's so great. And I mean their dance number with the paint, the wet paint is <laughs> yeah. hilarious. Like, this like I can't wait to show my daughter this, my son this. Like I like, oh, this is gonna be one to like How old are they? Nine and gonna be seven at the end of next month. So. Oh happy early birthday. Yeah. Okay, so a couple years. Couple years, couple years. I'm getting him into <laughs> things. I I'm I'm showing him some Hitchcock right now. He's He's liking it. And she's oh dang. Yeah, she's really into like fantasy stuff right now, so that's interesting. Do you have Labyrinth on repeat yet? Oh, they love Labyrinth. That's it. Yeah, that's one they love. <laughs> that's one. They also love Monty Python and the Holy Grail. They asked. Oh, that nice. A lot. So, have they seen Bill and Ted yet? Yes. Well, okay. my son's seen all three, and my daughter saw the new one and loved it. And then she's like, "Wait, there's two more." I'm like. <laughs> Yeah, yes, there are. She is smart. She could make sense of that movie without seeing the past, too. <laughs> she thought it was great. Yeah, she's. Hey, when you're that old, I mean, that, you don't care about continuity. It's just the movie before you. That's true. I thought the greatest movie when I was really little was Supergirl. So yeah, I. It's I get still, it. It's still pretty great. <laughs> don't don't even. <laughs> it's better than Superman three. It's better than Superman four. I'll watch it over Superman Returns. I dig that Supergirl. Either cut, give it to me. Like I, I do like that movie. 
See, this is why I want to talk Drop Dead Gorgeous. That, that's the kind of brain I want to talk about this movie. <laughs> there we go. I mean, Supergirl has Matt Frewer as a truck trucker rapist. I mean, how with a with a uh, with a Dr. Pepper shirt? He has some shirt on. Like, how did that company let their logo be on him during that scene? It's so funny. It's so. Oh gosh, that movie. Oh, I did an episode of my old show on that one, and I and I I edited the that scene with Frewer into like making I I, th- I want to say it's Dr Pepper is it Dr Pepper I don't remember I made it sound like a commercial for that company using that scene That's awesome I mean find it. Or maybe I, I should watch it, it again I don't even have it on Blu-ray but I paid $40 for it on DVD at Suncoast I I bought it back in the day the I limited the, edition Yeah li- that's yeah the double Disc yep, from that, Ang- was it Anchor that, Bay got to put that yeah, out, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I have that. Like, I, I've held on to it. Like, I'm like, I'm like, I, I paid, I don't think I paid 40 for it. I think I paid like 25 or 30. But that, yeah, it's worth it. Peter O'Toole drunk. Like, come on. Like, <laughs> the movie's entertaining as hell. I'll do super girl, but we know, we know, full bar. We're ready. Full bar. You need to remodel <laughs> your kitchen. Back to Drop Dead Gorgeous. Speaking of <laughs> movies that bombed or whatever, this movie had like negative reviews, pretty much. But um, it and it bombed at the box office. Like, like it date. It came out in the summer of 1999. So this is building it up to why I say it's a true cult classic, because you can talk to plenty of people who haven't seen it. Yes, we have Twitter and stuff. We know we're not alone now. But it bombed the box office in the summer of 1999. It debuted at number 11. Didn't even crack the top 10. Here's what was ahead of it at the box office. So The Haunting and Inspector Gadget opened at number one and number two. And we're talking the Yandabont Haunting. Uh, Look, it's not good, but that was a big splashy, hey, sexy people in the haunted house. No, we didn't know. We didn't know. I saw it opening. (laughs) I went on a date on opening weekend. It's all good. The rest of the top 10 was uh, the third week of American Pie. Eyes Wide Shut fell from number one, Big Daddy's fifth week, uh, Lake Placid week two, Wild Wild West at number four, Tarzan week six, The Wood second week, the, and The Phantom Menace week 10. So it finished right behind Star Wars episode one, The Phantom Menace. But you'd think this would get yoinked right away. It played for seven weeks. And a week, so it kind of played like up. a cult film. Yeah, that that's what cult films do. They and start well, but they hang out. Well, I'm talking like they. It went from like it dropped the second week, like it made like a million dollars, and then it was like under five hundred thousand, hundred thousand, and then it made like sixty eight thousand, and then the next week was like two hundred thousand. So like five friends talked to five friends, and they yeah, went, and then it went back down, and then it was gone. But it was really funny. Like it bumped up from like sixty eight thousand to two hundred thousand one week, and I, I was like, "Whoa, what happened? What the the cool people found it? Did that's it what happened. Do- did it hit dollar theaters that week? Maybe and people maybe I that's how I saw most movies back then. With my mom, we just go to the dollar theater in the nineties. I would go to the dollar theater all the time. Like yeah, every weekend. God, that that list of movies was a time capsule for me. Mm-hmm. Can I tell you my little Phantom Menace story? Always, yes. Okay. So I was I was fifteen, my boyfriend and our our friend couple, and we wanted to see the South Park movie that just come out, uh, but we were too young. But we're like, whatever, we'll buy Phantom Menace tickets and then we'll just go into South Park. Mm-hmm. They were checking IDs right before you got into the theater. You already had your oh. ticket. Then they were checking your ID so we couldn't get through. <laughs> so I had already seen Phantom Menace like two or three times because it was a big deal, you know, back then. But I, we just wanted to see South Park so bad. We were just like these surly young teenagers in the back row. We, yeah. we lasted 15 minutes and then we just walked out <laughs> and hung out in the parking lot. Oh. But yeah, just a time capsule. <laughs> summer like nineteen ninety nine is like this like great movie year for movies that I didn't realize was happening while I was in it. You know, like we never do. We never know we until never after. Know. And then we look back now, and I'm like, oh yeah, shit, I saw all that that packed. year. Oh, oh, yeah. wow. And it, it's like <laughs> overshadowed by like oh, the Phantom Menace came out. I'm like, yeah, but look at everything else. Like like Drop Dead Gorgeous. I would count as like yeah, ninety nine was really good. We got Drop Dead Gorgeous that year. Like it's it's just insane. Like, like oh man, you can go through you can just make. And your collection. have you seen Dick? 
Well, when I get in the shower. <laughs> um, yeah, I saw I saw Dick long ago. I have to revisit it because it's been yeah. forever. Because it's her. That one Williams, I saw in theaters. Right? That one I, I helped out. <laughs> Okay, because that was with Michelle Williams, right? Yes. So I'm a Halloween fanboy, and I had to go support my peeps. Cause That's she was right. H2O, so I did see that. I think I rented that, rented that one. But if you want to see, like, this is, you know, this is a very female comedy, and they, mm-hmm. they do every kind of comedy. There's gross-out comedy. There's physical comedy, just dry wit, every type of comedy, and all the juiciest roles are to women. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. the, there's not enough of that. No. Yeah. Not, still today, still today. I mean, like <laughs> I remember, like I liked, uh, what was the the sweetest thing with Cameron Diaz? Like had a lot of cool gross out things that you don't use, like I you wouldn't expect in a female comedy. <laughs> like the, have you seen that movie? No, I haven't. I know of it, but I, I never I remember, saw it. I haven't seen it since college. But I remember there was a part where Selma Blair was like going down on a guy, and like had some like got stuck on his pants or something and they were trying to calm her down freaking out and everybody sings Aerosmith don't want to miss a thing to her while trying to calm and it's a really funny scene I was like wow okay but girls can have fun too yes <laughs> I was going to point out there's just this much boy drama in this but in the next scene he's killed off and it's yep. never spoken of again which right. is refreshing right yeah and it lets girls be girls, but also lets it just be real and fun too. Like it's there's like a there's a reality and a respect treated with them as well. It's pretty awesome. Well, yeah, because we're we're all just people. Like the contestants, there's a, a weird girl obsessed with dogs. <laughs> there's uh, one adopted by Asian parents who just wants to be a country western star. <laughs> right. right. Yes. Oh gosh, yeah. The, I, we didn't even talk about the country. That Asian couple. <laughs> <laughs> obsessed with being as American as possible. Yeah. And their daughter just giving looks in the background. Just so No, I kind of loved it because she uh she was fully bought into it for them. She just loved them so much. She's like, Yeah, super American. Oh, and then you see her in the background and she's wearing the shirt with them and the <laughs> in the, the audience during that scene. And her talent show is just like firing plastic guns to a country <laughs> song back and forth. Country Western. <laughs> Country. Oh, gosh. Oh, so fun. Uh, just see it. We can tell you every scene that happens in this, and we wouldn't spoil it for you. It's so fun to watch. Some of the best comedians and actors uh, of the time just having a blast. Yeah, I guess nowadays it's been labeled problematic because of some of the language used and stuff, but it's not glorifying that. They're just being realistic about how the shitty way people right. talk about other people. Mm-hmm. But, you know, be aware of that, I guess. Um, I, I no, it's, it's like a, a problem you're going to find in the 90s. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah, was, no, it's a minefield. There, there's <laughs> stuff that was just regular lingo back then. None of that even stood out to me back then. I watched it now and I was so aware of it. Well, like, <laughs> I, I, I love, like, I love Can't Hardly Wait, but... There is some slang in there that ain't cool to say. Oh, yeah. Not to say it was cool at the time, but it was in the regular vernacular. It's just normal. Yeah. It was in the regular vernacular then. <laughs> Apologize for all of it because I probably, I know I probably said stuff like that, but um, that, but like, I'm like, oh, ooh. Yeah. Like Mike Dexter, somebody called me up. Yeah. It's. That was, but that that was like if you could time capsule it and you were at a party then that shit was getting said. That would like if you want something to be real, yeah, you know, I guess. But yeah, th- yeah, there will be some things, but it's a time time capsule too. Not saying it was right now or then, but it's there. So yeah, be forewarned. <laughs> yeah, but it it is excellent, and you just uh, everyone seems like they had a blast making this, which yeah, it's fun we to need watch. A retrospective on it that would be great. Well, it had its twentieth anniversary about I two mean, years ago. Which filmed makes you feel- a filmed look back. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing where I'm circling back to Warner Archive. I wouldn't hate it if they made it easy to farm out their movies because mm-hmm. they just would port over what was that on disc mm-hmm. 
and not do extra extras they, they do, except they, for Curse yeah like nine they do. yeah and uh mystery of the wax museum but and, uh, that that's Halloween the exception did. to the yeah. rule that's the exception to the rule yeah yeah because like i they should have done a commentary with me interviewing michael patrick jane on this okay yep. that should have been <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. There you go. I have a lot of questions. There you go. Yeah, should, should have had it right there. Yeah. I, yeah. They, they, once in a while, they, they said it back with Curse of Frankenstein. They're like, oh, yeah. If, we, if this does well, it did. We'll do more. And since we've seen, like, Isle of the Dead got some things, but that's the only one. Like, I review their titles. It's the only one I've seen with stuff. And it's two, it's a USC professor and a restoration guy just talking about the times. So. Yeah, definitely. And it's on HBO Max for those of you non-discers. And it's it's on uh, Tubi if you don't mind yeah, ads yeah. And, and you don't want to shell out for HBO Max's fancy physical media destroying prices apparently. Brandon doesn't care about funding. I have HBO Max. Funding the enemy. I'm an AT&T customer, so I have HBO Max for free. I haven't given them a dime. Oh, I see. Yes. You're giving your money to a bigger monster. Yes. <laughs> Because I didn't want to give it to another monster, and then I don't like this monster, and we're just trapped forever. Forever. I'll just get uh, plastic cups with strings, and if you're cool, you'll get a string, and you can connect it to a plastic t- cup, and we can talk. So. All right, all right. Enjoy your HBO Max. All right, all right. <laughs> What else? This is where we talk about other things we may have read, listened to, written, done, whatever. So, Stephanie, what else? I, I just saw uh, Barb and Star go to Vista oh. Del Mar, speaking of comedies with women in them. There you go. That's a good one. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Like, nowadays, the trend is high concept comedies. Like, it can't just be a comedy. Like, there has to be a spy Mm -hmm. and explosions and things like that. But it's so absurd. And it has so much fun with it. It was great. Yeah, I felt like if that one, like, felt like if you took, uh, like, a a laying, like, a Mike Myers script that was laying around and didn't get used and you refurbished it, like, it kind of had some of that comedy. That reminded me of a little bit, especially more so the spy stuff kind of felt Austin Powersy. Yeah. Um, but no, I I loved my my favorite part was the the dates where they go on the same date. I laughed. <laughs> that, that yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah, I don't know. I've been uh, working a lot, and so I've been rewatching comfort things. I rewatched all the Nolan Batman movies, which okay. is so much fun. I haven't seen them in years, and. Um, I rewatched Tango and Cash, which is one of my favorite comedy action that movie buddy is movies. Awesome. Don't let tell I you. cannot believe Kurt Russell and Sylvester Stallone's chemistry in that. Like they should have done an entire enormous series of movies. Like they should be on number fifteen at this point. Right. Well, I think he asked him to be in Expendables, and he said no. So I, I can't blame him for that. But no, I want them to be Tango and Cash forever. Right. Right. <laughs> until it's grumpy old men. Oh yeah, that movie ends on a high five, right? I think, like a close up. Yeah, it's so good, <laughs> so good. I love that movie. And Nolan Batman's are great too. Yeah, I know that's like the most popular, obvious thing to bring up, but I, I really have not seen them but in a not very at the long same time. time because it's so cool to diss Christopher Nolan and just those Batman movies now when you're high and mighty on the Twitter and stuff. Like, no, they're fantastic. Don't do yeah. that. They're so no. fun and so beautifully crafted. Like yeah. those movies. They they give a shit like yeah they really give a shit they're, about everything. They're well filmed and technically awesome like movies like I I just don't like you can like you can like those and like the Marvel ones. Did you know that? Did you know I that? did. I have them all on Blu-ray. Right. I have every Marvel movie on Blu-ray right, yeah. and those. But I still haven't seen Snyder Cut because oh. I don't have HBO Max. You don't have HBO Max. Well, yeah, it's it's, it's not even like a, so. Oh, okay. So you can not have well, HBO Max and just wait for that four-hour cut. Okay. Well, I'm, I'll just say I'm very excited for the, the Suicide Squad. <laughs> I am too. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like a lot of fun. I like the wackiness. My what else? Uh, I'm going to go with a comic book I read. Um, I've it, It's like dated, but uh, House of X. I read the collecting <gasps> thing of that. It's. Have you read it? No, I was thinking of House of M. 
Oh, okay. for some reason, my brain went there. There is a X Men House of M. No, I know that's what I read. That's where I went okay. to. But yeah, okay. I, <laughs> I'm with I read it. House of X, which is like the uh, Hickman like reset of everything X Men. And I was, I was like, someone was like, hey, uh, I got this. You want to read? I'm like, all right, all right, I'll read it. And I was like, oh, well, I need more of this after I got done with it. I was like, this is really, it makes Days of Future Past look like, I don't know, simple. Because um, it, it goes through like four different like timelines. And Moira McTaggart is this like mutant with an ability to respond. Like when she dies, she starts her birth again from the same spot. So she's trying to figure out like, how to stop mutantdom from being extinct or like something else. So sometimes she lives like thousands of years. Sometimes she, li- and it's crazy, but it only, life falls, is like, so stressful for those mutants. It is, but this is a <laughs> first professor X no longer gives a fuck. Like all the mutants, like, like uh professor X apocalypse Magneto. They're all like together now. Like they have this, like, t- like it, they have their own uh, mutants have their Island and they want to be recognized as a like national entity, and it explains why Cyclops and Wolverine and shit can be around all the time. And for like, it's crazy. Like there, there's this thing. Like there's these these five mutants that on their own their powers are like stupid, but when you put them together, they create this process that they can clone and bring back to life people from where they last died. Like it's pretty pretty cool so people can go on like suicide missions and then they get brought back because cerebro professor x uses he can not only find where mutants are but he can copy their information like a computer and re-put it back in whatever the embryos they grow up back it's pretty interesting I sounds doubt, like how I long Marvel, is it it's, it's 12 issues um okay and then they break off into whatever series they're doing but they're being smart about those so there's it's like all right, after House of X, and it's House of X and Powers of X, it, but it was like one, 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 and they it's one whole story. But after that, they, it's like, okay, now there's all these like eight different spinoff series that have their own thing, but they are collecting those in something called Dawn of X. So you get Dawn of X, so you get like X-Men issue one, X-Force issue one, Marauders issue one. So like you don't have to like, you can have those all right there and not have to buy like X-Men one through six X Force one and like figure it out. They're they're doing it like that, which is very nice. And for a guy like me, yeah. that works. So I'm into this. I, I like this new little world they got and their spin on people. And uh it's, it's interesting so far. But yeah, House of X, high recommend. Definitely. And you don't have to know shit about X Men before it too. It's it's a good clean I get there's some references to things that if you're very into X Men, it's like, oh ha, ha nice. But other than that, it's a clean, clean start. That's a good way to do yeah, it. I had I hadn't read X Men since the nineties, so there you go. Yeah, I have some collections back there, but I'm very behind. Yeah, everybody does. Like that's how I get in and out of comic books. Like I will be in my life. I was like really big until I went to like college, and of course I didn't have the money to buy comics. So I went to beer, and then <laughs> uh, when I lived in Los Angeles, I got back into comics for a bit, and then I moved home and I back here and i did have a job and so of course my didn't go comics and then i decided to get on board with when marvel relaunched star wars and then they decided we need to make like 80 billion series and i'm like i'm out that's just too much for me to pay attention to and then now here i am reading x-men collections so all right well that'll do it for this episode of the brandon (laughs) peter show (laughs) so happy you came back i rather i enjoy recording with you even though we have the little errors and stuff so brandon's never gonna have me back on because of my terrible internet connection today but it was lovely and i appreciate it i had a lot of fun thank you (laughs) well hey let people know where they can keep up with your happenings oh no one wants to do that but i guess you can follow me on twitter at scrawfish all right. And I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Brandon4KUHD, written work at YSOBlue.com. There's more from the Brandon Peter Show this week. But for now, always remember to keep the positivity in your online film chatter. Thank you for listening. The Brandon Peter Show is a Creative Zombie Studios production. Produced by Brad Shoemaker and Brandon Peters. Written and edited by Brandon Peters. Announcer vocals by Jessica Olsman. Theme song by Metavari. 
Web design and show art by Brad Shoemaker with Brandon Peters. All music and clips featured in the episode are property of their respective studios and no infringement is intended. Additional information on this and other episodes at brandonpetershow.com. For any inquiries, press opportunities, or sponsorship, contact mail at brandonpetershow.com. The show is available on Apple Music, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are found. your favorites. How nice, Becky. She's anorexic. She's skinny, Amber. Not deaf.